The law of e-discovery has as its roots a series of decisions that date back to 1990. The decision that really shaped most of a lot of the discussion for today is the Zubalaki versus UBS, UBS Warburg case. In a series of seven opinions issued between 2003 and 2004, Judge Shira A. Schendelin, sitting in the Southern District of New York, slapped UBS Warburg, with a large Swiss in bank investment bank, with increasingly severe sanctions for its failure to produce electronic records. And let me tell you that what was at heart of this case was an employment dispute. It was a gender discrimination dispute where the plaintiff, a woman, was claiming that in fact she'd been discriminated against in her decisions about her promotion. And what happened is, is that that created a situation where a lawsuit was boiling and where a series of decisions were made then that would lead to electronic records being discovered and in fact electronic records being destroyed that led to case opinions that shape our law today. Now when you think about the electronic discovery dispute that must have been facing the, the U, UBS Warburg folks from uh, Switzerland, we have a, a problem of I've got all this data, I can search it and deliver it to you, but of course the cost of it might be prohibitive. And what they're doing is they're pretty much taking the position and had taken the position that there's nothing there. This is just a way of holding us up and we're resisting the provisions of the electronic discovery at every turn. And the cost shifting analysis does provoke then questions about are you asking for a specifically tailored discovery request or are you just looking for a search through all kinds of records that could potentially be used against the person that you're suing? Number two, there is a concern and a question when you're searching whether or not you've got availability from other sources for this information. And that sits as a backdrop to a court's looking at any e-discovery dispute what have you done if you're the plaintiff to try to find out how to get this information without having to search broadly everything that the company has? Number three, if you're Warburg, you're looking at it and you're saying, well, look at how much is this going to cost us in the light of the controversy as a whole? And frankly, a court is going to be concerned at some point whether the cost of the discovery are more than you'd ever be able to get in a lawsuit. Number four, the cost compared to the resources of the parties is going to be a major factor in trying to sort out how we're going to manage this discovery dispute. Number five, the ability of each party to control those costs, to be able to control the costs of the search, of the gathering, of the preservation and the production. And finally, the importance of the issues at stake will shape the court's concerns about whether some of this process, this e-discovery process, is going to be shifted to one side or the other. And, I've, I, and finally, number seven is the relative benefits to the parties. Now, if you're Warburg, the question is, do you have a duty to preserve that, those documents and that data in the light of the fact that you learned that there's time when you were going to be sued? And then you remember that the way that the law sets itself out is the law provides that you do have a duty to preserve discovery when you, the party, reasonably should know that the litigation might occur. And so, in Zuba Lake, in August of 2001, almost everyone associated with Zuba Lake recognized the possibility that she might sue. We have then this notion that it doesn't necessarily mean that she has to be suing. She doesn't have to file the complaint for the duty to preserve to run, but it's when the party should know that a lawsuit's coming where you may have an obligation to start to preserve. And the bank failed to comply with its own document retention uh, policies in regard to keeping documents when they had notice, when they reasonably knew that a lawsuit was coming their way. And so Zula Lake puts the position of when does that duty arise, and frankly, the question is, and by Zuba Lake, is when a reasonable party would know that a litigation would occur. 
Now, what are the lawyer's responsibilities then to get with the client under Zuba Lake and to deal with the problem? Well, we know that once you have a reasonable belief that the lawsuit's coming, you have to locate relevant information, and the lawyer has an obligation to try to find out and sort out what might be relevant. It's the lawyer's duty to understand relevance in, a law, in relationship to this coming lawsuit. And to preserve that information that's located and timely produce the information. Counsel, says Zubalek, must take affirmative steps to monitor compliance that all sources of the discoverable information are identified and searched. So, the lawyer now becomes a vital part to this preservation activity. The lawyer is in charge of identifying and then preserving and working with, usually general counsel and institution, or work, working with the client to make sure that this information is not going to be destroyed. It's also important to realize that the lawyer then is going to be tasked, according to Zlupa Lake, with the implementation of a litigation hold, of making sure that the right parties are notified, of making sure that the right authority gives the direction to continue to preserve the information so that it's not destroyed. Now, litigation hold requirements that are put out by the Zuba Lake decision are the following. It's the reasonable anticipation of litigation rule, and it requires you to examine the key players to make sure that you control backup tapes and that the reasonable anticipation rule, the key players rule, and the backups tapes rule then tell us from Zuba Lake's perspective that your obligation is to be able to manage and preserve that information on the way into the dispute. Let me draw attention to a couple other pieces of the Zuba Lake decision just to make sure that you see the ramifications of this all. In Zuba Lake, what you had is you had a problem with uh, the employee who is presumably looking for emails that ex were exchanged between these various parties to inform them as to whether or not gender was an issue in why she was not given the promotion or the, the raise that she was seeking. And so what you have in Zuba Lake 5 is you have a question of the deletion of emails that's put squarely before the court. It turns out that some of the emails were never produced, including emails that were pertained, that pertained directly to the relevant conversations between the employees. Again, the employee requested sanctions in the form of an adverse inference jury instruction. Now, you remember what that is. That means that if, in fact, something's been destroyed during this period of time, an email, for example, that might have shown that the parties were talking about and using gender to discriminate against her, that in fact the jury may be instructed in a jury instruction that they should make the presumption, the inference, against the person who has not accounted for that discovery. And the court further notes that defense counsel is, def is to blame in that situation, that in fact it's counsel's responsibility to institute systems and procedures to make sure that the electronic discovery has not been destroyed. Council must take affirmative steps to monitor compliance, says Zuba Lake, so that all sources of discoverable information are identified and searched. Specifically, the court concluded that attorneys are obligated to ensure all relevant documents are discovered, retained, and produced. Now let me go on and just add a couple other things here to Zuba Lake. The court articulates two important concepts with respect to litigation holds. As I said, that reasonable anticipation rule, the duty to preserve, begins when a party reasonably anticipates the litigation. At that point, it must suspend routine document destruction and put the litigation hold in place to ensure the preservation of relevant documents. The key players rule requires you to look at the possible individuals who may be making decisions and potentially to also think about their laptops, their own computers, their own sources of information of those key players, and not only seek to preserve what the company itself has in the way of systems, but also to make sure that you're looking at more broadly 
what discovery they may have in their possession that could be destroyed. And then finally, this question of backup tapes. You know, at a time when what you had is routinely disaster relief plans in uh, big institutions, they were required to have document retention policies and backup tapes. Certainly we know in September 11 what we have is a, a stark example of how if a disaster hits that the company could be wiped out and if it doesn't have a record keeping ability in some way, its continued viability is obviously Im impaired and in jeopardy. And so to have a system that does backup tapes and then creates storage of those backup tapes and puts them in caves in New Jersey or wherever those things are stored is very important to this whole process of being a business. It turns out then that the same time that you're backing up your business, you may also be backing up litigation that can be used against you. Because it turns out that if in fact those backup tapes are destroyed or are not managed or are not organized appropriately and when they exist and are evidence that's part of a discovery request that needs to be turned over, it's your duty to ensure those, to capture them and to make sure that uh, backup tape is not being reused and in, or in some ways some kinds of uh, backup systems are being destroyed as they go through some routine um, uh, recycling processes. So, litigation hold requirements are on matters and in divisions of companies that have to do with the litigation and it has to do with not just the lawsuit that's been filed but it's in the reasonable anticipation of the litigation. Key players is a key part and obviously a concern about backup tapes is what Zubalake is talking to us about. Now, we know that after Zuba Lake, what we did is we had a mass meeting of the drafters of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure for them to try to come up with a set of rules and principles for managing e-discovery. And we'll look at what the rules are that come up with, but before we go there, let me just talk to you about, and by the way, Judge Sheldon was a member of that Rules Advisory Committee, was the same Judge Sheldon who wrote the Zubalak opinion. But let me talk to you about Morgan Stanley because Morgan Stanley is a, a kind of the, the worst nightmare for litigators. In Coleman Holdings versus Morgan Stanley, what we have is we have a scenario involving the very best lawyers and the very best law firms in the country doing battle over electronic discovery. The lawsuit really basically was a lawsuit that involved Coleman Holding Company Remember, Coleman Products is uh, the manufacturers and designers of camping goods, you know, Coleman stoves, etc. And they were involved in a lawsuit involving Morgan Stanley. The bank wound up with a judgment of $1.5 billion against the bank, including $850 million in punitive damages because of the electronic discovery problems. So Morgan Stanley, $1.5 billion judgment, $850 million in punitive damages. How in the world could this all happen? The case arose out of a merger between Coleman, that camping goods, and Sunbeam, an appliance manufacturer. Coleman claims that it was fraudulently induced to agree to the merger because Sunbeam's finances were misrepresented. Coleman settled with Sunbeam but pursued Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley is the underwriter because Morgan Stanley presumably is putting the deal together and financing the deal together and they said Morgan Stanley knew that in fact Sunbeam had misrepresented its financial conditions. Now, the case proceeds as follows. The dispute arose over Morgan Stanley's electronic discoveries of its backup tapes. What happened is that there was a litigation hold that had been put in place in the Morgan Stanley case. And uh, the IT department, in fact, had gathered backup tapes from a number of litigations that had Morgan Stanley had been involved in over a number of years. They had, in fact, thought that they had gathered all of their electronic discovery into an archive, and it was in that archive then that they were presumably meeting the litigation hold requirements in the case. 
Now by 2001, Morgan Stanley was trying to use these tapes, backups, in a variety of litigation, discovery, regulatory, and investigative responses. The law department had ordered a halt to the recycling of the backup tapes in January 2001. In a short time, it had accumulated, as you might imagine, a huge volume of backup tapes that had not been recycled. However, because of the one-year policy followed by the IT department, the law department thought it had no backup tapes in a vintage earlier than 2000. It thought that they were recycling those tapes once a year and did not know that in fact there were backups of the backups that had been made and stored in a different location. In late 2001, Morgan Stanley started uh, to set up a hard drive archive system for ongoing basis for all emails from North American Operations, which was family, finally launched in 2003 after the expenditure of $4 million. So it built this archive system. Later in 2003, it decided to incorporate all of the old email backup tapes on a new system. In doing this, Morgan Stanley spent another $4 million and processed 35,000 backup tapes. So this brings us to October of 2003. Coleman files motion to compel directed at Morgan Stanley's production of its emails. Coleman wanted Morgan Stanley to search the backup tapes, not just the new archive. Morgan Stanley opposed this motion. The court granted the discovery. And Coleman took the deposition of the caretaker of the archive, who said it was a going forward system. The court ultimately found that the deposition revealed an attempt by Morgan Stanley to hide the future capability of the archive that would have included backup tapes from earlier. In May 2004, Coleman filed another motion to compel directed at the old emails from 1997 to 98. A compromise was worked out in accordance with in which the court ordered Morgan Stanley to search the oldest full backup tape pertaining to 36 specified employees in order to locate emails and to certify the results. Morgan Stanley had only a month to produce the required information. Morgan Stanley's team searched the archive, which by now contained old backup tapes, and the required certification was signed. Now let's just pause here and say what's being done is that the court is asking counsel to certify that the materials have been searched and that the information has been provided. You might imagine that then the conversations between counsel and the IT department in Morgan Stanley would be fraught with error. What does it mean we don't have them anymore? What does it mean they're not backed up? What does it mean we have a system that's only a going forward system? What is your document retention policy? By the way, what if some of the things were not recycled according to the document retention policy, even though you thought they were? How do I get behind all those kinds of questions? Well, in fact, in June 2004, there was a discovery that was made by Morgan Stanley. 1,400 backup tapes were discovered in a Bro Brooklyn storeroom. These tapes had never been added to the archive as their existence was unknown to the team that was assembling the archive. Shortly thereafter, a person who had signed the certification learned that some 112 of these tapes contained email. Those tapes were sent to the archive. Ah, but it gets worse the Manhattan tapes. At about this time, another 700 tapes were found in a communications room, Morgan Stanley's headquarters in Manhattan. These were incremental backup tapes rather than full backup tapes. But ultimately, they yielded another 1.3 million emails. The person who signed the certification learned about these tapes, and, when they were sent to the ar and then they were sent to the archive as well. The person who signed the certification neglected to inform the general counsel's office that more tapes with emails had been found, which made certification inaccurate. The lawyers apparently learned about this in October of 2004, and then Morgan Stanley placed the person who signed the certification and his team on administrative leave. Meanwhile, back at the archive, the team now had something like 600 gigabytes to load onto the archive. And that didn't get done until February 2005 for a variety of reasons. In addition, it turned out that there was 
programming errors in putting the emails into the archive that affected the accuracy of the searches. Something about not being case specific or the ability to be able to read different kinds of, of uh, emails depending upon the case specificity of them. However, the lawyers wanted another search done of the archive for Coleman case and that was finished in November 2004, turning up another 8,000 pages of emails. Thomas Clare, a partner at Kirkland and Ellis, turned the emails together with a cover letter explaining why they had not been previously been located. The court found this statement to be misleading because it implied that the Brooklyn and Manhattan tapes had only recently been located when in fact they had been found in June. Then, late in 2004, a lawyer pursuing another matter with outside storage company where Morgan Stanley had stored backup tapes learned that three boxes of backup tapes had been sent for storage but not appear on the storage company's logs. For that reason, they had not been retrieved when the archive was being loaded with the backup tapes. These tapes, containing another 885,000 emails, were migrated into the archive in February of 2005. So, Coleman deposes the archive guy again in February 2005. He says he was confident now that all the tapes had been located. After his deposition though, just to be sure, he searches another room in the Manhattan headquarters and found more tapes. Then he dispatched staffers to Morgan Stanley's New Jersey facility and found still more tapes. These tapes had another 695,000 emails which were sent off to the archive. Meanwhile, back at the archive, more programming errors were found indicating that not all the responsive emails had been produced despite the many searches. And then the programmers discovered another error that truncated some of the emails that had been produced. Another search of the Brooklyn facility turns up more tapes in the securities room, the outside storage company again, Morgan Stanley also asked its outside storage company for a written certification that all the backup tapes had been sent to Morgan Stanley. The storage company found more than 100 misplaced boxes of backup tapes belonging to various customers including Morgan Stanley. The Morgan Stanley boxes contain about 3,000 additional tapes. They contain nearly 6 million emails. They were quickly dispatched to the archive. Note here that these are mistakes then of the outside storage company in its ability to maintain and retrieve the backup tapes. Then the contractor working on the processing emails for the archive announced that it had misunderstood the order to process all kinds of emails on the backup tapes found in Brooklyn and had in fact only processed two major kinds of emails, Lotus Notes and IMAP email. It had some novel, 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 novel files that had not been looked at to find out if there were CC mail email files. It turned out there were some. Those were added to the archive. In March 2005, Morgan Stanley told the judge that it would not be finished processing old emails at the archive until July of 2005 and asked for a continuance of the trial date. You might imagine, from the court's perspective, this was not well received. The, or, the judge ordered a partial default based on the e-discovery failures, preventing Morgan Stanley from offering any defense. The trial went forward on that basis, resulting in a $1.5 billion judgment. So, look, we've got a litigation hold in January 2001. We've got a certification that's made that all the backup tapes have been certified, that the archive has been searched, emails for 36 employees have been located, relevant documents have been produced. Then we've got Brooklyn tapes found, 1,400, Manhattan tapes found, 700. We've got the outside storage company with three, three boxes of tapes, New Jersey tapes of 695,000 emails, archive programming errors, Brooklyn case again, all facilities again, 670 tapes, the storage company again, 3,000 tapes, archive programming errors again. What do we take from all this? That there's no substitute 
for doing as a lawyer the groundwork yourself. For going and looking and finding where the tapes are stored and asking the questions to try to retrieve them. By sending an employee who may not understand the project or the importance of the project to a location to try to figure out what they have in the way of backup tapes is a situation that's fraught for communication error and frankly probably best to do it yourself. To be skeptical when somebody says they don't exist anymore. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean that tapes are recycled? What does it mean that you have a backup system? Where are things backed up? On the server for how long? And then do you have a backup tape system that is in place in addition? Be careful, obviously, in making representations to the court to make sure that you understand that what you certify is only as good as the information that you're given and the work that you've done yourself. And that these lessons from the law then, I hope, get our attention to see what it is that's being done with the new federal rules of electronic discovery. So let's stop here and take a minute and then talk about the new federal rules on e-discovery. <laughs>